What's the Big Idea? The Third Generation of Policies for Economic Growth, written by David Lindsor and Lance Pritchett, presented by James Donegan, Joseph Kelly, Anthony Harmon MacDonald and Katrina O'Connor. The overall objective of this paper was to highlight the failures of growth models presented by economists in the past and to offer a new and alternative approach to economic growth recommendations in a form of diagnostic decision making. The authors approach the complex path of development by dividing the previous approaches into two contrasting platforms of big ideas. They then introduce a third generation of big ideas that will influence the way future economists approach economic growth. The intention of the paper is the introduction of a new approach to growth and development that emphasises the work of the Washington Consensus, instilling the idea that no one exact path or method to growth. The different policies and regimes will work in different times and places. Linda and Pritchett are aware of the mistakes of past economists, acknowledging their arrogance and assuming their one remedy to ensuring fast and effective de development in states. They acknowledge that the route to sustainable development should consider more than just economic factors and that there are social contributors to the success and longevity of growth and development and policies must be adjusted accordingly. Conceptually, the paper divides itself into two sections. In the beginning, by taking a historical analysis of the big ideas used by economists in the 1960s and the 1980s. The paper not only explains to the reader the period of economic thinking, but asks the reader to identify themselves within the period, explaining the economic and social climate in which these opinions and decisions were made, and then asks them to apply the knowledge to a Latin American example. This is an important step within the paper. While it introduces the mistakes of the past economists, the authors are already introducing the idea to the reader that to make decisions regarding economic policies, they should be considering more than just the economic climate. The second phase of the paper looks at 2002 and introduces a third period of economic growth ideas that move on from the blanket policies of the past. It is the introduction of a diagnostic decision tree, following on from the Washington Consensus. Following the period after 1982 and the big facts of that time, the authors call for each country should develop their own economic policies that are based on their personal and specific cultural, geographical, political and economic needs. The use of empirical studies of Latin America explores why blanket policies utilised across states are not satisfactory in ensuring economic growth that can be sustained across time. The key hypothesis of the paper is that a more varied approach to the growth in the future will aid in the avoidance of policy mistakes that have been made in the past as a result of only focusing on economic contributors. The period of the 1960s big ideas follow recommendations of heavy government intervention and control, encouragement of industrialisation and the accumulation and government borrowing are central to the de development process. There was a call to avoid foreign direct investment and that little advantage could be seen to increase reliance on trade beyond that of importing capital goods. The 1980s, however, also convinced of their big ideas, called for a complete contrary set of policies that they believed the key to achieving universal growth and development. This period of growth trends calls for a less intense role from governments, believing it necessary but obstructive, a higher level of private sector investment and placed heavy importance on trade and integration, asking for an avoidance of government borrowing but an increase in foreign direct investment. Lindor and Pritchett look back on past events and recommendations with the knowledge of present circumstances. They can analyse the big ideas of yesterday with the awareness of the big facts of today. The conclusion they draw from this is retrospective analysis, is that policies of the past were far too imprecise to ensure sustained economic growth. The narrow spectrum of consideration meant that important factors were overlooked. The paper offers a paradoxical analysis of the steps for growth and development, that careful consideration by economists is more necessary than ever to approach growth sustainably. However, economic theories are less important as we argue that a more varied and inclusive evaluation of circumstance on a case-by-case -case basis will lead to a more appropriate policy recommendations. The article uses historical observations and empirical evidence as a method for analysing the concepts and arguments provided. The reader is asked to picture themselves in different generations, 1962 and 1982, 
as someone who has been given the task of advising growth policies, i.e. big ideas, for developing countries, perhaps as a professional economist or a policymaker. The insights that provided the popular mindset at the time of what are the factors that have been contributing to growth are described. For instance, in 1962, you may have been more likely to consider socialism highly capable and proficient in transforming countries into economic superpowers from taking note of the Soviet Union's high standing in your current world. You likely would have reflected on it once being politically and socially backward before socialism. The authors then juxtapose this historical outlook with the historical outlook 20 years later, emphasizing changes in the world that were unanticipated for, such as debt crises, rapid growth in Asian countries, and the Soviet Union not imposing as much of a presence as it had in the past. Also a popular mindset during 1962 was that the government was a driving force to, for development. This would have come from having lived through World War II and having witnessed the effect of planning, mobilization, and expansion in the economic activity achieved by the government during wartime. However, 20 years later, economists at the time would have bear witness to the failure of central planning in countries that it had been implemented in, such as Cuba and India, and see that instead of being critical for development, it can actually be detrimental to it. Evidently, this method of juxtaposing two eras works very well in demonstrating Lindier and Pritchett's arguments that there should be more to policy formation than just observation of the present and the past. In addition, the evidence provided complements the author's method. Ports in the World Bank are used to show slow growth rates as a result of central planning, as mentioned, and are also cited to demonstrate the prominent ideas during 1962 and 1982 under development assistance and the role of multilaterals heading in the summary tables. Moreover, since the article is largely focused on a historical outlook, accurate historical data is important. The facts are backed up in the footnotes provided. However, since certain data may not have been available at the time, the article sometimes references more recent papers that have researched the numbers to come up with a sufficient estimate. For instance, Angus Madison's book, Monitoring the World Economy, 1820 to 1992, Washington Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, gathered extensive research of the global economy throughout the modern era and is used for the growth rate numbers for the United States, Germany, Austria, Italy, and France in 1962, as exact numbers are not available for the period discussed. For the creation of the diagnostic tree for policy advice, the choice of the five elements, current level of income, current status of growth, linkages with the world economy, government strength, and government capacity are backed up by evidence to support their inclusion. For current levels of income, the authors note that rapid growth rates does not apply to all levels of income, as seen from China, India, and Vietnam's growth, whilst for government capacity, the author notes Taiwan's success as the low-income country with the traits of limited protection and a strong government capacity as an example to justify creating a branch for that element.